you've got this big summit tomorrow. Essentially, what is your message to several hundred clergy members, I understand, who will be there? Yes, we'll have uh, representatives from nine denominations who actually pastor somewhere in the neighborhood uh, of about uh, 10 million people. And uh, we are going to, first of all, uh, equip them with the information they need to know uh, about what they can say and what they cannot say uh, in the church uh, that would violate their 501c3 status with the IRS. In fact, we're going to have the IRS administrator there. We're going to have the Attorney General Eric Holder there. Uh, we're going to have the lawyers uh, organization from around the country at ACLU, all giving ministers guidance on what they can and cannot do. We sold out mighty cheap. I'm not jumping on anybody else. I participated in it. I did it ignorantly. What in the world? Why in the world? I, I didn't have the slightest idea in the world uh, that I was doing anything wrong until God opened my eyes in Covington, Georgia in 1983 on my knees and I had to settle the matter that, that even though it is a legal issue, it's not a legal issue. In essence, it is a spiritual issue. You guys know what separation of church and state is? That is where the government has decided that church needs to be diff separate from the state. And, you know, like it or, or not, I think just on a legal basis, it's probably pretty good. But here's the really weird thing. Did you know that a nonprofit organization, such as a church that has a nonprofit status, is actually owned by the state? Think about that for a second. Read the fine paperwork in a 501c3 corporation, like what you get from the government. You just research it online. That doesn't sound like separation of church and state to me. When you start a 501c3 corporation and you want to start a church and you want to be tax exempt, the government owns your church, man. That is not separation of church and state when the state owns the church. And your kids are going to school with a bunch of money in their pocket, and every time they go to school, the bully of the schoolyard comes up and steals his lunch money. you got a hard time continuing to give to them. You're going to have to teach them how to defend themselves. Well, that's what's been taking place. The churches that are out there right now are 501c3s. The Internal Revenue Service is over here in their pocket, and the Internal Revenue Service is a whole lot in their back pocket, and they're saying, oh, you don't talk about, about sin. We're not interested in hearing you talk about sin. And you're not going to get involved in politics because we'll come take away your 501c3 if you get involved in politics. Well, a lot of these rules weren't established at the point in time they got in that 501c3 and they didn't realize they were going to lose all those rights, but they took themselves and placed themselves in subjection to them because they were told to by attorneys and CPAs in the church. Well, you're in a situation now where... As a church, you're in a position where you're scared to death to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're scared to death to condemn sin. And the reason why you are is because if you condemn it, you're afraid they're going to come and take your stuff. Because they do have the authority to come take your stuff if you fall outside of the confines of the contract of the 501c3 rules and regulations. And now you're in a position as a church where you not only have that as a problem, but you're also sitting in a situation where if you all of a sudden make that decision to stop, to start talking about politics and to deal with sin the way you need to deal with sin, you're in a situation where they come in and say, you're no longer tax exempt. And because you're not tax exempt, we're going to declare all back taxes on you and your property. So we're going to go back now and you owe us four million dollars for the back taxes that you have and we're going to apply penalties and interest because you violated your 501c3. So they're in a situation where they can come take all their stuff because they violated their tax exemption status. And the worst part about it is attorneys have now taken and put churches in a position where they've not only done that but they're pledging the people in the church as surety against the church. You're coming in and now you're a member of the church you're a stockholder of that church, and if the church has a difficulty, they're going to come to you for that money. Not only that, but you're also in a situation where if you personally donated money to the church, and that money that you personally donated to the church, you wrote off on your income taxes, they declare that church to not be a, 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 a proper tax exemption status. Now they're in a situation where they'll come back and say, 
that was disallowed, and because that was disallowed, you owe back taxes and penalties and interest on everything that you donated because it was a disallowed, disallowed exemption. So the churches that are out there are sitting in a situation where the house was built on sand. And, but I want to illustrate this point about the state not having jurisdiction over a church. And this is a very interesting case that was adjudicated very recently, 1981. And in this case, I'll tell you, the judge was absolutely amazed by this church. And notice what he says here. <clears throat> the State Street Baptist Church has been in existence for over 140 years. In 1973, the membership organized a nonprofit corporation. Once the church determined to enter the realm of Caesar, by forming a corporation, it was required to abide by the rules of Caesar, or in this case, the statutes of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Now, what is the judge saying there? What are you guys doing here in my court? You existed for 140 years as what? A church. See, the, the judge got it. He understood this principle, and he actually talked about it in this case. The court has no jurisdiction over a church. What are you guys doing here? You bunch of dummies. You reorganized to something that we have jurisdiction over. The judge didn't even want to hear this case. You realize judges hate it. Most of them hate seeing churches come before them. They get very annoyed by this. I've spoken with some judges that have had to try these incorporated church cases. They don't like it. They'd rather not have to deal with it. But the attorney talked them into taking state privileges and benefits. Do we have government-controlled churches here in America? The sad answer to that is yes, we do. They willingly, and I, I don't blame the preachers so much as I blame the lawyers. You know, these Christian lawyers that go out there and tell these preachers to go out and get incorporated under the headship of the government and become 501c3 tax-exempt corporations when they already have tax exemption. You don't have to go to the government and beg, you know, can we please preach? Can we? Can we? Can you give us a license? Can you give us your permission? It's just very, very messed up. Very far away from not only what our founding fathers stood for, but also from what the Bible teaches. I mean, please show me some scripture where the Lord said, Go ye into all nations and you know, preach the gospel to every creature, but first go down to the local Roman magistrate and get a license. Show it to me. It's not in there. And you say, well, you know, it's not a big deal and everything. Well, the government doesn't always enforce the laws of 501c3, but the fact of the matter is, and this is in my house church video, you lose your First Amendment rights when you incorporate with the government. You do. You're not allowed to speak against the politicians, and you are not allowed to do anything to influence legislation. You lose your First Amendment right. And there are all these... Preachers, you know, they get controversial and they'll, and they'll cut on Obama or say something bad about Obama and the, and the police come in and say, you do that again, we're going to take you to jail. And the, pre the pastors righteously stand up and say, you have no right. I have freedom of religion. No, you don't. If you sign up as a 501c3, you don't have freedom of religion anymore. You don't have freedom of speech. You are a creature of the state. Yeah. And by the way, something that's actually interesting, when you write off 10% of your income on your tax return, the IRS looks at that and they say, wait a second, what's going on here? Where's this 10% of their income? Where's that going? Actually writing off your tithes and offerings can actually invite litigation from the IRS. Did you know that? And I know of numerous couples that give generously, you know, they give a lot of money to ministries and they write it off in their taxes and they've been audited. Something to think about there. Okay, and you know, it really comes down to a matter of obedience to the Word of God or convenience. But you see, when you become an incorporated church, or if you're part of one, uh, you... If you're going to an incorporated church, I've got to tell you something else, too, here. The church itself is a creature of the state, and the property that you are on is 
government property. Now, that church under 501c3 rules is not allowed to do anything to influence legislation or to speak against the political leaders. You're not allowed to do that. So you are giving up your First Amendment rights, not only the pastor, but even if you enter the property, you are on government land and you have forfeited your First Amendment rights. It belonged to the government. So the government, if that church would have closed its doors and said, we're declaring, you know, we're, we're no longer a church, we're dissolved, that church or the government would have taken that, their own property, and they would give it to somebody else. And you say, well, that wouldn't be too bad. It'd just be given to another church. Oh, not exactly. You see, it would be given to another 501c3 corporation. And you ought to study who gets 501c3 tax exemption. There are witchcraft churches. The Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, is a 501c3 corporation. So you could literally have the government stepping in and saying Christianity is now illegal and revoking the church property, which they own, the government owns, and giving it to the Church of Satan. That could happen. And how did the system come about? It came about because back in the 1960s, under Lyndon Baines Johnson, this 501c3 monster was created where the government now controls the churches here in America. I mean, you hear the stories about in China, communist China, and in Russia, how that the government owns the churches there. And you think, oh man, that would be horrible if it ever came here to America. It already has. You say, well, Brian, you know, you just haven't proved your case. I don't think it's really that bad of a thing for a church to seek official recognition under the government, 501c3. Not a big deal. We've been doing it for so long. Okay, well, let me say this. Let's say I'm driving through the city one day, and I look and I see a prostitute on the street corner. And I go over and I, you know, start to flirt with her or something like that. And I say, hey, I'd like to marry you. And she says, oh, sure, that'd be great. And I marry a prostitute. So now I'm married to a lost woman. I'm unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. And she doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, doesn't want anything to do with church, and she's going to go right on earning money as a prostitute. And I pray and I say, God, please bless my marriage. Is God going to answer that prayer? He can't. God can't bless a marriage that is contrary to the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, God can't bless a church that is yoked up to the prostitute that is now our government. July the 2nd, 1954. July the 2nd, 1954, it all changed. That's why we are in this auditorium tonight with the concerns we have. On that day, then-Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson had returned from Texas after a hard-fought battle running for the Senate angry at two businessmen in this state because they had secular not-for-profit corporations that had been against him because they thought he was soft on communism. He returned to the Senate chambers as a bill to overhaul the tax code was passing through and he inserted what was called, has been called, the Johnson Amendment. It passed by a voice vote with no discussion. But the result of the Johnson Amendment is it put a speech restriction on 501c3s. There are 29 different categories of the IRS delineation of 501c, but the one in which the church falls is 501c3. Johnson's legislative aide, chief legislative aide, admitted later they didn't even have churches in mind. They were angry at two businessmen for their not-for-profit corporations here in the state of Texas. But the IRS seized the moment knowing that now we had speech restriction officially on churches for the first time up to that time in 170 years of history, of American history, where there had been no governmental intrusion in the pulpit at all. And a cultural myth developed with a misunderstanding of the phrase, the separation of church and state, which has muzzled, chilled, silenced, and intimidated pastors and even people in the pew 
mistakenly believe that there should be some kind of governmental restriction on what is said in the pulpit. We did not receive tax exemption as churches because we did a swap saying we would not speak on political issues. The churches are tax exempt because our founding fathers knew there should be a complete separation, the right definition, of the separation of church and state. And what the federal government can tax, it can control, and it can kill. Therefore, there was to never be ever any tax on the churches. They were tax exempt, totally free. Until the restriction came, the speech restriction came and begin to put a chill on pastors because attorneys and even the IRS itself is not entirely certain how to define the Johnson Amendment. It's not the first speech restriction that's ever been on the church. The first on the church was all the way back in the early pages of the book of Acts when they told Peter and John, do not speak of Jesus. And the way Peter and John handled that speech restriction then is how every pastor ought to handle a speech restriction now. No governmental intrusion in the pulpit at all. Law ever become a reality in America? Some fear any nuclear, biological, or chemical attack on U.S. territory might trigger just that. And as KSLA News 12 Jeff Farrell discovered, the clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem, us. From my cold, dead hands. Charlton Heston's famous declaration captures a truly American value the overarching desire to protect our freedoms. But gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. U.S. troops also arrived, something far easier to do even now thanks to last year's elimination of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. That forbid U.S. troops from policing on American soil. If martial law were enacted here at home, like depicted in the movie The Siege, Easing public fears and quelling dissent would be critical. And that's exactly what the clergy response team, as it's called, helped accomplish in New Orleans. Uh, Jeff, the primary thing that we say to anybody is let's cooperate and get this thing over with, and then we'll settle the differences once the crisis is over. Such clergy response teams would walk a tightrope between the needs of the government versus the wishes of the public. In a lot of cases, these clergy would already be known in the neighborhoods in which they're helping to defuse that situation. For the clergy, one of the biggest tools that they will have in helping calm the public down or obey the law is the Bible itself, specifically Romans, Romans 13. Because the government is established by the Lord, you know, and, uh, and that's what we believe in the Christian faith. That's what's stated in the scripture. Civil rights advocates believe the amount of public cooperation may depend largely on how long they expect the suspension of their rights might last. Jeff Farrell, KSLA News 12 reporting. And according to Tuberville, during Hurricane Katrina, the clergy response team provided 38 chaplains a day around the clock at eight different camps. Is it possible that all churches and religion in the United States could be banished or regulated by the federal government as it was in the Soviet Union? A Wall Street lawyer says in a national magazine that we could lose all religious freedom if the present government course continues. In that article, this lawyer is quoted as saying, increasing attempts to regulate churches are in violation of the Constitution. Now, such an attempt was made January the 3rd, 1979, against the Worldwide Church of God, which sponsors this program. We had to fight the battle to preserve the Constitution of the United States, separating church and state. But the real issue has now surfaced. The whole question is, who is the Lord? Is it Caesar or is Christ Lord? And that is going to have to be settled in the United States. And that is the real question at issue now. Mm -hmm. Who is Lord?